we're actors, we're creators, we're trying to make the world a little bit of a better place, one piece at a time, one moment of truth at, the, at a time. And um, you can become fatigued, you can get a feeling of not knowing um, if this is really what you should be doing, or if you're doing it right, or if you become a little bit disenchanted just because that's the way your life is going, or if you feel like you need to, you know, have a have a go at at um, having a personal life, then you should do that. But that said, you're actors. <laughs> you're not going to want to do it for too long. Your hands and your feet are going to get itchy, and you're going to want to get back in the game. Go forward with courage. That's all I can say. Be fearless. Thank you. What's up, everyone? How's it going? I'm not going to waste any time because I'm already stressing about this mile long <laughs> list of questions. I got a bunch of great questions from all of you, too. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brendan Fraser. <laughs> That welcome was electric. Oh my. I've been here for a lot of very enthusiastic Q&A audiences. I think that's like something I want seared in my brain forever and to always, you know, always remember and it's, it's for you and you, you earned it. You really deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Now live up to it, Brendan. <laughs> so we have the pleasure of going all the way back to the beginning during this conversation, and I always love asking this first. Do you remember the movie, the performance, or personal experience you had that first made you say to yourself, I have to be an actor and nothing else? Yeah, I was a kid in uh, the 1970s, and my family traveled a great deal. We uh, were in Europe, and we would take holidays in London, and that's when I first started seeing plays. Um, I remember the titles. They were Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> Oliver, um, I saw The Mouse Trap when it was probably in its 35th year. Now it's in its like 135th year. Same production, same house, by the way. Um, I remember seeing the play and not, not, it, a, a jewel box opened up, a big full of toys and it was bigger than life and I thought I want to do that I want to I want to be up there I want to I want to tell the stories that 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 I read when I, uh, in the library when I, you know when you're a kid and and it, it had come to life and uh, that's how it began it began for me was uh, by seeing um, theatrical productions so it's one yeah. thing to look out there and say I want to do that it's another thing to feel that confidence that you can. So do you remember the first time on set or maybe in a classroom something clicked and you felt acting become an itch you needed to keep scratching? Yeah, um, I guess it, the interest continued until I was a, a, a teenager and um, because we're always looking to find ways to belong, um, we've all felt like we've had our nose pressed up against the glass and we want what's in there, and so the little theater company at the high school I attended in Toronto was really the only reason I was allowed to stay in high school, given my crummy grades. <laughs> um, and I started doing, you know, productions, the productions that were there. Um, and you know, just because you want to doesn't mean you can, but you have to have the the will. Um, and then. High school became college really quickly, and I had to make a decision about uh, how to continue. And I realized very quickly that um, I needed training. <laughs> yeah, so I did that. I, I auditioned um, for uh, a conservatory program. I was in Seattle, in Washington at that time, and the school I went to was called Cornish College of the arts, it's still there. Um, and I got the last absolute finish, no more audition um, before Labor Day weekend uh, had ended when the semester began. And uh, I, I, I went in 
completely ill-prepared with my standard comedy and uh, tragedy, serious and not so serious monologue. I think I even might have done a few bars of Oklahoma or something. <laughs> you, know? you should have been there. <laughs> But they let me in, um, and I found that out on the following Tuesday morning only by calling in because I hadn't heard, and someone in the office went, what's your name? I, Brendan Fraser, hang on. Thump, clatter, clatter. I hear someone in, you know, moving Rolodex things around. Oh yeah, get in here, now you're in. I'm like, what, <laughs> now? Like, All right, and it was off, um, off, off, off I went to, uh, to begin my journey to, to train as an actor. Um, and. Uh, after that, I guess I started looking for a job, and then I wound up here at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I have so many questions about yeah. choosing to study a craft like this in a formal program like that, because it's the right path for some, and it's not for others. You did get the BFA, but I also read somewhere that you were considering getting an MFA as well, and then decided to pivot and just get started with work. So at that point, what signaled to you that work was the best route and that the, the training had ended? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, logistically, I was coming from Seattle down the coast, and uh, I had a, uh, a full tilt scholarship to SMU, um, and they were anticipating me to arrive and do a master's program um, the following, you know, September, new, new year. And uh, I thought, well, I'll just I'll stop in Los Angeles, where I really hadn't spent any time, and I'll get some work there at this pilot season thing. Right? <laughs> and in my naivete, I honestly thought of like flying airplanes, you know, pilot season. I, my, my. <laughs> and I did work really pretty quickly. Um, and I realized, for me, it made more sense to um, plant my flag and start here um, and, you know, effectively learn on the job rather than take another four years of what could have looked like teaching a bunch of 101 classes. But, you know, nothing, no, no harm in that. Um, but I felt time was short, and I, I had the enthusiasm and, and, and the exigency to, to get to work right away. Or I think you're really, truthfully, you're just going to learn what you need to know to have a career in the arts by doing it, or you know, stumbling your way through it until you figure out what it is that you're doing and how to do it the best you can. With that in mind, given the schooling that you did do, what is something you learned in that program that you still hold tight to and actually use oh, to this day? But this, then oh uh, yeah, this, 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 this. Come on, everybody, try it. No, seriously, it stays in the body and the mind. It helps you, you know, little habits like that that actors need to get into. Um, uh, breathing exercises. Um, Having uh, a sense of that, I'll just say it, that dread of, oh no, I got the job, now I have to do it. <laughs> um, better roll your sleeves up and do some work. Um, and then, and remembering that there's a reason why it's called a play. It's because it's fun, you know? Don't lose sight of that. It's the best job ever. Just don't tell anybody. Because it's, <laughs> it's nice work if you can get it. The flip side of that question now. Let's say you had gone to that MFA program, had all the schooling in the world. What is something that all those programs could never have taught you about the reality of being a working actor? Um, you're going to wait for the phone to ring, and it might not. Um, you're going to have to have, um, have courage to, to say, yes, I want to do this. I mean, it, it really, it takes, it takes the intestinal fortitude to be an actor. It does. Because there's a, I guess a seeming understanding or you know, a prevalent attitude that, that it's easy work. Or, you know, and it's not. It, I mean, the, the real job is making it look easy. But I, I know what goes into bringing you to that place. And to just uh, own that. It is who you are and it is what you must do for your fulfillment at the same time that you have to pay attention to other areas of your life, your family, your kids, maybe you're still seeking education, you know, you got a job, a day job. I mean, those are, 
those are all real, real concerns. Um, again, I think you just, you have to be, you have to be brave because to, to be a hero doesn't mean that you've got a helmet on with a brush on top of it and a little circular shield and a little sword and you're fighting a dragon or something. Maybe sometimes it does, but you have to acknowledge that there's something out there that's an obstacle, that's prohibitive or something you need to get around or go through or over or above. And how are you going to do that? What, what, what tactics will you uh, deploy and and that's really what acting is in my view um, essentially about and and to have the courage of that hero guy it, it makes all the difference because um, it's not an easy job but it's a good one yeah. in awe of what everyone and all I kept thinking about as you were explaining this was I went to school for producing and I always admired actors and respected the craft, but it wasn't until I took a directing the actors class and I had to be the actor being directed that I fully felt like the vulnerability that it doesn't matter what genre, the vulnerability no. that has to go into doing a good performance. And I don't know, I've, I've never looked back. Oh. <laughs> I you think know, about that I, often. Well, it is. We, like, we, we decide, are you in front of the camera? Are you behind the camera? I'm, that's a... It's a big line of delineation. This is a stage that could be a proscenium here. I mean, I go on this side of it, this side, you're way back there, pulling levers and switches. It, 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 it's all uh, a part of what goes into this art. And um, you, you find where you're most comfortable. Sometimes, you know, those jobs change a little bit. Sometimes you're the one, uh, you're the one writing what everyone is up here saying. And um, I think it comes down to having the passion to want to create and, and also, you know, stay um, in that mindset of who you were. In my case, when you're a young person, you, you want to belong. You want to belong to a group. I mean, we're, 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 we're itinerants as creators, as actors. Right? I'm in a room full of actors, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, you know the drill. We, we, we bond quickly, we, we come together for a common purpose, and we put together this piece of art, whatever it is. And, and we work for it, and we're proud of it, and it lives on its own, not in a vacuum, but only before an audience. And then once it's over, it's either captured in, on a camera or in some other format, or it, it lives uh, in one evening only. And then it's, it's in the ether again. And it's, it's, it takes, um, it takes a, a unique set skill to work together and, and, and learn to be um, able not only to, to give direction, but also to direct yourself um, in, in absence of feeling like you're really confident in what you're doing. Um, I, I admire each and every one of you who are in this room, by the way. I'm, I say that from the heart, I do, because um, I know what your, I don't know where you are in your careers and lives. I, I hope they're, are, I, I hope they're fruitful. I hope that they're interesting. I hope that you are able to you know, get close to what it is that you really want to do. And maybe you don't know yet. Maybe you're still figuring it out, and that's okay. I'm still figuring some things out also. So I say this because we're kind of all in it together. I'll throw that idea back your way. Now, what is something that's important to you in your own craft that you, when you were first starting out, never would have imagined would have become a priority? Hmm. What well, was important when I was starting out now that wasn't then? Um, I got my union card in 1991, and I had been uh, Taft Heart lead on a film called um, Dogfight. It was with uh, River Phoenix, mm -hmm. Lily Taylor, um, and it shot in Seattle where I was a student just after I graduated. Um, and the first one's free, you know. I was uh, sailor number one. <laughs> they gave me a short haircut, a sailor costume, and one line. 
how'd you like to eat my shit? <laughs> Got me in the union. <laughs> when I got that card, um, it felt like a world of possibility opened. It was, it's a core memory of mine. I, I had, like I said, I moved from Seattle and I hung my hat here for a little while and I, I needed to get, you know, legit real quick and I uh, had something to go do. I don't remember it is at the moment, but I needed certification. And I went into the office on Hollywood Boulevard and it was it, it was like it was going on seven o'clock at night and they wanted to close down and they kept the office open for me and it, I, I wish I could thank the person who signed me up that day um, because I, I could see that she was making an effort and it wasn't just for me. She would have done this for any aspirant walking in her door to, to go through the motions of signing you up, taking my check for $700 and blah, blah, blah dollars, you know. And, and um, it, I felt like I was made that day. And um, in a way, it, it really was the ticket to a portal that was my destiny. Destiny that led to many a titles we have to touch on right now. I'll start with School Ties because I believe that's the first one you filmed before Encino Man, even though the release dates might have been swapped there. Correct, yes. So, jumping onto that set and now looking back on that experience, what is something that makes you say, I'm so glad that my first big leading role was on that set with those people? Well, um, in truth, uh, the the first job job I had before uh, the big screen, before feature films, was, uh, again, I did get a pilot. No, not flying an airplane. Um, it was a Castle Rock, and uh, it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, uh, a series about uh, college kids and um, college kid stuff. And uh, it was produced by the creators of um, um, uh, my, what was it called? My my life, my things. No, no, no. Earlier with Fred Ward. Uh, um, uh, this is the part. Somebody Google it for me, will you please? We're supposed to have our phones away. I should know this. It's in your research. Anyway, look, I got a job. That's all that matters. And they were going to pay me and uh, to show up and do what I did. But the rub was there were. It was like a seven-year contract that I signed, and and uh, you know when you're starting off, you you you, you ink anything, and knowing what I know now, I, I we're we're different about this now, which is good. Um, by the way, it didn't get picked up, so I got off the hook. I didn't have to work seven years. Um, I, I I learned a lot there, pretty much just about the flow of work, the chaos of a day on a, on a pilot, um, really what it took to, to, um, to be a part of that, the enthusiasm surrounding it. And then, you know, suddenly as it all started, uh, the wonder years, that's what it was. <laughs> that was close! Wow! Look, I, I didn't get stuck on the spinoff Wonder Year show but for that long. I went on to do a, um, a movie of the week with Martin Sheen, and uh, it shot in um, Pittsburgh. And it was about a guy who got thrown in jail, and what, he didn't do it, and he should have gotten out, and then Martin gets him out, because that's what Martin does. And, <laughs> and uh, we really shot in a jail, like the downtown jail. And I was wearing the uh, same strip as all the prisoners were with the difference being that I had one of those club stamps, <laughs> the invisible ink under the blue light, you know? So, <laughs> fun story. Um, they changed shift, um, and so the day guards went off to go, go do their bartending jobs or go home to their kids or whatever, and the new guys were coming on, and uh, we were standing around in um, 
the, the booking area of where the door opens right onto the streets of Pittsburgh. And I'm standing there with the rest of the crew waiting to find out what's next. And the new guys, the new, new guards are coming on and they see me standing on the wrong side of a red line on the floor. And the next thing I knew, I was up against the wall. With my, I totally jacked up. <laughs> and I can hear the desk sergeant going, <laughs> And producers are screaming, he's with us, he's with us. And I'm like, it was the Dukes, it was the Dukes. <laughs> I stick my hand under the light and close yellow. <laughs> I was like, look at this, I don't want to be an actor anymore. This job sucks. <laughs> me, man, beat me up. Anyway, I digress. But then as I was about to walk out of the street because we got kicked out of the prison for an entirely different reason it had to do with Martin being in the warden's office giving an office and then he kicked the warden out of his own office. <laughs> you can't make this up. And the warden picked up the phone and said, everyone out of the pool, you know. And so we were getting all the gear and I'm walking out and that same Cheshire cat guard, uh, he's going, oh, I wouldn't go outside dressed like that. <laughs> You see those guard towers up there? Yeah. <laughs> Put a sweatshirt on. <laughs> okay. And then I quit, and I went and I sold insurance, and the whole rest of my life was a fraud. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. What was the question again? I think I had started with school ties, but we, we, we went down that route. <laughs> school ties was great. I got, um, <laughs> I got, I got hired to work with Matt Damon and all the guys. And um, at first, I didn't get the job because it was a different director, a different casting director. And then I went off and I, and I did the jail movie. And then uh, they want to make the movie school ties still. And a new director in Bob Mandel and producer Sherry Lansing, who was also then um, a president of production at, uh, at Paramount who was, was producing, and um, they said, uh, go and um, sh uh, read for Sherry. I did. She said, what are you doing Thursday? I um, said, do you, do you want, I want you to test. And I'm like, I th honestly, I thought like it was exam time or SA <laughs> SATs or something. And like, you know, I'm the same guy who's thinking about pilots flying, you know. Anyway, no, it's not. You go and you do like basically an audition. They're going to film it. and. So it was back to the Paramount lot. Um, Tak Fujimoto was the was the DP. Um, you know, we all got to start somewhere, right? And um, and I read with Matt, and I felt um, like I knew right away. Like those guys already had the job, um, and I didn't. And I, I knew that I needed to pull it back. Um, I mean, because I was 22, I think. I mean, all that all of my experience had been. Um, on a stage like this, um, playing to the bat last row, you need to size things down a little bit. Don't, don't, uh, don't paint with a ten-inch brush. You know, you got to get a little far, more fine-tuned. And I, I tried my best to just match, match pitch with with Matt. And I'm I'm convinced that that's what got me hired. Was was um, just um, having a. That, that sort of uh, bookending companionship uh, in a way of approaching doing the scene. Um, I was thrilled, yes, um, I did get hired. We shot in Massachusetts uh, shortly thereafter. I had been, during that time, um, uh, repeatedly um, uh, reconnected with by the producers of Encino Man, who <laughs> who were convinced that I was the guy for the job because in my audition before school ties, I had gone into there knowing very little about the story other than he's the new guy in town and he basically just wants to be everyone's friend and he hasn't seen anything ever before. And it reminded me of everything I loved about the clown work I did in, in, at Cornish. Um, which we all fancied ourselves Junior Buster Keatons and Charlie Chaplins and, and Bill Irwins. And we, 
we, uh, I had that sensibility on board and I guess they really liked it because I was um, unafraid to wrestle with the plants in the room and you know, paint the walls with water bottles because it said so in the script. And they were, in, they were insistent that I do the film and, and um, you know, bend my rubber arm. It, it made sense to me when uh, sound, the sound recorder on School Ties great guy named Keith Wester, he's not with us anymore, but he, he had a real, um, like a mentoring relationship with all of us. We really looked towards him. Not, not just because we needed batteries, because we wanted <laughs> to put them in our um, Game Boy to play Tetris, which we did. <laughs> um, but because he was a good guy and he let, he, um, he, he, I remember he said, you know, a bird in hands worth two in the nest, I think as the phrase goes. I, I'm thinking about birds and hands and nests again you know, airplanes and piloting, <laughs> my brain. But the point was, is he was saying, you've got a, a calling card, um, which will show you to have this comic ability and this dramatic ability. And that's a not bad combination for, for you starting off. And it really made sense to me. So um, I took his advice and I went forward with, uh, with that plan. Oh my, I have so many follow-up questions. Yeah. You, just, you just brought up this special connection you have with, with a sound guy, and we, I don't think we hear about that kind of relationship between actors and crew members a lot like that. So is there any other additional crew member further on in your career who oh, has yeah. made that kind of impression on you that you want people to know about? Makeup artists. Um, ben Nye Jr. was the makeup artist at the screen test. Like, everybody, look in your kit and says Ben Nye on it. Yeah, that one, him. It was his son, but still. And you know, so I was starstruck when I met him and that he was brilliant at his job and, and it's a lovely, lovely guy. He, he also introduced me to um, how a film set really worked, who you speak to, um, to, to really just get through the day. Um, I, I learned about, um, you know, the, uh, sign in and sign out sheets and and making sure that everything's not done in pencil because those numbers get fudged sometimes and and, and you know you, you, I came up through the ropes just asking um, questions and and um, paying attention to how the all the the levers of power get switched and thrown to really make um, a movie come together costumers um, uh, I love directors of photography. The camera guys were always my favorite to pick their brain. Um, operators, um, I, I, uh, I loved to ask them about what lenses we're using, what size, um, uh, terminology that was really helpful. Um, learning, learning simple things about eye lines, um, how to, uh, um, how to how to how to how to how to get along really pretty much and the value in and honestly just having a good relationship with everyone that you're going to be there working with because um, it's a small campus and I, believe me like right now for me it's exciting and everything I'm running into people now who I haven't seen in 30 years 25 years and we're still freaking here you know. <laughs> So what you're doing is important. Like no matter, thank you. But no matter, you know, the size of the job or you know the importance of it, how you feel about. It, pay attention, because if you love this work the way I do, you're still going to be doing it. They're going to have to pull you away, kicking and screaming, <laughs> and and you just might run into a friend of yours that you made doing a movie 30 years ago about a caveman that got thawed out. <laughs> And one of the friends you made on that movie is Ki Hui Kwan. Yeah. You seem like the kind of person who would ask any question when you were first starting out. I love asking this because sometimes when you're first starting out in this industry, it can be intimidating to ask a question that you think someone else might deem silly, and you should know that already. So what is a seemingly silly question you would encourage more actors first starting out to ask? Um, make sure um, that you get better footwear. 
You're going to be on your feet a long time, okay? You want them to be comfortable. I'm serious. You think about it. Joe Montaigne wasn't wrong when he told me that. Because if they're looking at your feet, you're not doing your job, kid. You know, like, unless it's about your feet. Um, questions to ask. Don't be afraid to ask um, to, to look at the big book anytime, this, the script supervisor. That's important. Um, and I appreciate that more uh, as I get closer to making relationships with writers, because they've gone to a real effort to put the words on the page for you to speak. You know, we owe it to them to, you know, not play so loosey-goosey with the dialogue, you know. If they wrote it, let's say it, you know. Um, what else? Um, another good question, when's lunch? <laughs> That and per diem, <laughs> also important. I have great respect for all of those questions. <laughs> Going back to what you were just saying about having, uh, having your foot in different genres with School Ties and Encino Man, after having done those two movies, were you, because this is an industry that has a habit of boxing folks into something that works and works well, were you being nudged, I guess, in one direction or another? And if so, is that direction what you wanted or were your sights set on something different? Um, I, I, I'm gonna presume that you know, every actor has it within them to be the sinner or the saint, okay? You know, the comedy, tragedy, you know, and all the faces in between, so. In my case, yeah. Starting off, I was I was the uh, I was <laughs> I was the naif. I was the babe in the woods. I was I was the the new guy in town. Um, goes along to get along, um, and then yeah, you can become um, recognized mostly for that sort of um, one area of of your performance abilities. But um, make diverse choices. Um, do something diametrically opposed to whatever it was you did before, if you can. You know, wouldn't it be nice? But make those efforts. Speak to your representatives and agents and, and seek out uh, um, work that, that really lets you stretch and grow. And um, don't be concerned about the size of the project or your uh, you know, screen time in it. That's not so important. You really want to show everyone how you've captured lightning in a bottle. And then um, once you've done that, find a different bottle. <laughs> Keep moving forward. I swear I'm going to leave Encino Man, but just because I've thought of this, have you put much thought into where Link might be today? <laughs> <laughs>
you'll know the, the quality of your work because you were there. And how it's received really comes down to, um, I think, the audience reaction. I, I've done plenty of movies that laid an egg, and then years later, it's you know like everyone's favorite. And you know, like where were you when? Is what you wonder. <laughs> but um, you just never know. So I, I think it's just important to just really put in your best effort all the time. Yeah. Airheads is my movie in that department. I've watched that movie more times than I can count. <laughs> Which was not a success when we when it came out. Um, and I've been to fan conventions. I love going to those, by the way. Um, and they show up dressed like Chaz Darby, and you know, like everyone um, sees it as a as like a you know a throwback nostalgic cult hit. Now, um, at the time, we were just glad to have a job. Um, they had craft service, like. <laughs> No, seriously, like really good crab service with peanut butter. Huh? That's the key word right there, peanut butter. I love it. I'm going to ask the flip side of the box office question now because success did come with George of the Jungle. So, with okay, with George of the Jungle. With that, what would you say is a misconception about being the headliner of a box office smash hit, but then also, what is something that did indeed change for the better when that movie hit so big? Um, well, I was known on every, everywhere, um, and um, that, that changed, um, but I was kind of not known as the guy who wore clothing. So most people didn't, rec didn't recognize me for a while, I think. I'm joking. I, um, <laughs> I, think, I think what happened was is it, it made um, it easier for um, studios, producers, et cetera, to feel comfortable bringing their project to you. Um, because in, in success, it breeds more success until it doesn't, <laughs> and then um, the opposite happens. I think it gave me, um, it gave me just a real shot in the arm and um, uh, like a, a feeling of, um, of confidence. And, and personally, it, it made me happy that a lot of little kids were really, really taken for that too. Yeah. yeah. And those kids have kids now. Oh my God, I'm old, I just remember. <laughs> That success then continued with the mummy, and I know you've you've spoken more more applause, please. I know you've spoken pretty extensively about the physical challenges you went through doing that franchise. Now looking back, what would you say to someone who wants to find that right balance between coming across like they're giving a role they're all, but understanding that they're doing so within reason? Hmm. Um, well. Uh, so, so you, we, you never really know what a film is, how it's going to be received. You know, there, there can be an expectation because it's built in with an audience, with a, you know, a franchise or something like that. But every now and then uh, a movie comes out that, that um, you just don't know the result. When we did The Mummy, it was um, decided relatively at the last two, three months about where it would be shot. We, we, we were told it would be Arizona or New Mexico, ho-hum, but uh, the late Jim Jacks was insistent on taking the production all the way to Marrakesh, to Morocco. And the reason being is because he was a cineast, he loved movies, and, and he felt uh, that the, the authenticity of um, being in the desert, in the place where films have succeeded before, like like uh, like Gunga Din and, and uh, Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, this was the same environment, and and the spirit of the screenplay then was um, all at once uh, a comedy, an action picture with moments of heightened drama, some some wingding wingnut business and energy going on and some comic relief, camels, lots of camels, um, <laughs> heroes, heroines, it, it was kind of all over the map and, and it, it, was, um, it was a mishmash and we didn't really know what the movie was and I, I, can, <laughs> I can still hear Rachel going, oh no, the guy 
going to confiscate our equity cards. <laughs> I don't do a very good Rachel. <laughs> Hi, Rach. <laughs> oh, meaning, <laughs> there, there was not enough scenery that we couldn't chew up. <laughs> like, beavers making that movie is what we felt like. But one thing we had going for us is that we were fully committed to the world of that movie. And um, also having um, the support of uh, uh, what was the cutting edge then in um, CGI technology, which was at ILM. Uh, the Magic Hat, the John Burton at ILM. And um, that way we could uh, really deliver on, on Stephen Summers' um, his, his, his touchstone image, or what, as he pitched it, he was like, this is not, you know, the mummy that's wrapped up in bandages going, uh, slowly coming after you, which is great, it's fine. It's, it's the Terminator mummy, it's Jaws mummy, it, you can't stop it, and you know, and, and, and to pitch that to the studio, as he later told us, was not easy. So the movie was kind of all over the place, but we found it through test audiences, and, um, you know, sometimes that lightning strikes in that bottle and you're lucky. What can I say? Struck big time with that franchise. I'm jumping, I'm jumping ahead. Actually, maybe I'll throw in a broader question just so we could hit some of your earlier titles before moving on to the more recent ones. Of all of your earliest films, which would you say put into focus the most? What was most important to you in terms of the types of stories you wanted to tell and also the types of on-set experiences you wanted to have? Um. In the 90s, uh, films were being made, they were, they were then, they were called indies. I mean, they kind of are now, but they were independent films. And that, that spirit of being the um, owners of your own material for filmmakers, so that they didn't feel that they were encroached on by the nameless, faceless studio executive far away who doesn't understand what it is that the filmmaker is trying to create and making you know, uh, decisions that might alter that vision. And, and so that, that was a movement in, um, in filmmaking and that, you know, it birthed uh, this, this Sundance Film Festival and um, a lot of those movies were all made on a shoestring budget, um, but they were daring, they were brave. They, they had um, a, a vision that that was held on to, and it, it wasn't, you know, a studio amalgamation of ideas and, uh, you know, honestly, a formula. Um, and hey, there's room for both. Is let's let's not kid each other. But the films that I made then, they were, they were they were all in that spirit too. They were um, movies like Twenty Bucks, um, 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 Twilight of the Golds. Um, Gosh, I have to go down memory lane to think of all these titles, but I, I knew that as long as I was doing something, that um, the size of it and the scope of it didn't really matter. I don't know if you would have thought yeah. this way then, because I get the sense that you didn't, but is there any opportunity that came your way and made you stop and think, you know, like, this isn't worth my time, I don't want to do it, but you did do it, and you wound up growing in a way that you still value today because of it? Um, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, honestly, I, I did feel, maybe I felt, I might have felt like that on, on maybe the sequel to The Mummy at first. I was a little precious, like, you know, I, I, I you know, I had some success here, and, and, you know, and I just want to see development and character and why is this mummy so angry, you know? <laughs> I don't know if this is for me or not. And I, I, had, a, I had dinner with Keanu one night and, and I was oh, very serious. And, and, and he said, oh, if it hurts your heart, man, you just... <laughs> don't do it. Man. But if you do it, man, then put your heart into it. Great. <laughs> you nailed that impression. 
All right, I'm going to jump ahead now. I'm going to jump ahead to... Uh... Never told that story before. <laughs> hey, Keanu. I'll jump ahead to a period when you had no feature films, but you were doing a lot of TV. And I, I got a couple of questions about that. <laughs> First, was that a personal choice to veer towards TV, or is that a direction the industry itself was pushing you in, and how did you feel about it at the time? When uh, There was a period in the 90s, just the late 90s and early 2000s, um, when uh, what we call linear TV now, um, then was just TV. It was the elephant's graveyard as far as the sentiment of what becomes of your career if you've been working in feature films and then suddenly you're on, I don't know, a, a, a daytime show or something like that, that, that sent a message to everyone that you've, you've had diminished opportunities. It's not like that any longer and I'm so glad for that because the point is I believe in actors. I know that you're capable of working de minimis and maximus the same way, as long as you approach the same work, the same way. So for me, um, I, 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 I was careful to try and stick with feature films as much as I could. But the business changed um, uh, irrevocably around 2000 and, I'm going to call it nine, eight or nine, when we all kind of went from um, analog to digital, you know, from horse and cart to an internal combustion engine. The technology changed. Um, so many venues that we can see the work on screens in front of us on the subway. We live in this world, you know what I'm talking about. And so that meant that there's a glut of content to go on there. and. It spawned a great deal of of, uh, of really exciting work, almost like an embarrassment of riches for how much opportunity there was, and that breeds a lot of competition about whose eyes are you going to get to watch this. Um, so I, I feel now that. I think some of the best work, more interesting work, is staying true to the spirit of what those independent filmmakers were in the 90s or has spilled over and uh, that work ethic has spilled over into what's going on on um, series television on the streamers and uh, I think it's great it's really exciting yeah yeah is there anything about spending a considerable amount of time working in the series format that when you did get another feature film you found influencing your work in the feature film format for the better you know they're, they're really kind of similar because um, the series format that we know now, which I didn't explain very articulately a moment ago, like e each episode is its own um, miniature feature film, you know, depending on um, the vision of it, the support of it. When I did, um, uh, when I did Trust for Danny Boyle at FX, um, each, uh, each episode was a short feature film. And, um, it, it just it just proved that um, it doesn't matter. You know, that's Danny Boyle. You know, he, he's it, there's no no harm, no no shame in the game to go and work in in streaming. It's it's um, it's the same discipline. I think it's the same approach um, to how you do your job um, on, on whichever scale, whether it's you know considered a small one or a big one. I think I think it's more even playing playing field nowadays. It's we're in a good place. It's blurring the lines on our side of the business too. Yeah. I used to walk around calling myself a movie journalist, but now I cover TV too. And yeah. and you could also loop in video games, which tell incredible narratives. And I do. I, f I feel like it's more it's it's more like storytelling journalism more so than anything in any format, any medium. I know, and we live for TikToks. <laughs> Imagine I mean, that. So much for little. short attention theater. <laughs> 
Here, here's a, a big question, but I know there were some periods where there was less work in your life and the focus was more on personal elements. And that can be a very difficult thing to decide to do in this business where you're expected to be operating at an 11 nonstop. So for anyone out there who may be at a point where they need to prioritize self over work for a little, but they're afraid that if they go down that path too far, the door might close behind them, what would you tell them? Do what you need to do for your life. I mean, look, we're, we're actors, we're creators. We're trying to make the world a little bit of a better place, one piece at a time, one moment of truth at, the, at a time. And um, you can become fatigued. You can get a feeling of not knowing um, if this is really what you should be doing or if you're doing it right or if you become a little bit disenchanted just because that's the way your life is going, or if you feel like you need to, you know, have a, have a go at, at um, having a personal life, then you should do that. And I, I'm glad to say that because I know that at our union, if you find yourself falling on those times, there's people who can help you now, and that's, that's good. I'm, I'm glad we have that support system. So if you need to step back. Um, but that said, you're actors. <laughs> you're not going to want to do it for too long. Your hands and your feet are going to get itchy, and you're going to want to get back in the game. Go forward with courage. That's all I can say. Be fearless. Got one broader question for you before we get into the well specifically. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. Hopefully, we can hit a couple of titles this way. Of all of the co-stars you've ever had, whose process would you say is most similar to yours? Where the second you hit set, you were immediately in sync. But then, can you name someone who challenged you to adapt and maybe adapt and try something new for the better? Um, Michael Caine. Um, it, I, I'm really flattering myself by saying that. <laughs> Because Michael's super objective is to get back to the motorhome. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh, he's brilliant and everything on top of that. And I'm brilliant too, because you know, Michael. Can. It's honestly just to keep working until you know when your next break is going to be. It's important. I mean that. You know, Navy SEALs do the same thing. Just survive until lunch, you know? <laughs> Just set self short goals. Um, that, and I wasn't allowed to wear a blue shirt. Michael had to wear the blue shirts. <laughs> I want a blue shirt. <laughs> Michael Kane, what's he ever done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, he wrote a book that I read religiously about how to act for camera. <laughs> And there's a great bit, I don't know, go look it up. He, he does, where's the cat? There it is. He go, <laughs> sorry, he go, something? No, no, nothing? Something? <laughs> nothing? Something. Are you on me for that? No, you're not. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's look, just, he does it better than I ever could, <laughs> please. Practical tips for the actor from Michael. He's a pragmatic guy. That and the feeling I know that he also has is that when you finish a job, and this is serious. He's like, well, that's it. I'm going to go on uh, social insurance now, is what he's saying. Like, Seriously, this is Michael Caine. And you think about it. He still has that humility. He's, he's, he's a man who grew up uh, in the east, the east End of London when it was bombed out. It had very little, um, and there was a class-structured um, society that he was born into, and to become an actor meant uh, that you remove yourself from that in so many ways. And all of that never left him, never left him. So the, the newness and the, and the joy of, um, of, of having the work, it, it's, it's still as relevant to him when he was beginning as to who he was when I worked with him which was in 2001. I think he turned 75 that year. So um, I, I, I say this because I expect you all to be in the game for a good long time, because I intend to be. And just know that we all have the same path. We all kind of go on the same journey, humble beginnings to wherever it takes you. 
And you're still the same person underneath it all. That's what I'm saying. I am obsessed with your The Whale co-stars. Your, your ensemble you. is exceptional. To highlight the variety of different processes there are out there, can you name two of the whale co-stars who have completely different approaches to the work where when you're their main scene partner, you're, you know that you're gonna get a completely different acting experience? Well, Hong Chao is incredible, so just accept that. <laughs> um, Hong has, um, a, she's, she, she, has, she has formal training. Um, she is seasoned for having worked on stage for a screen. Um, she's among those actors that we recognize who are able to convey more in between lines of dialogue and in the silences and the pauses than very often actors can do when we're speaking lines that we've been given. And it's a gift, it's a talent, it's developed, I don't know, but she's brilliant that way. And, and, and she um, has a fully fledged ability to create a character who you, I, I wondered at who are you when you're not in this movie, in this show, you know, like I wanted to know. Um, pardon my insouciance, have y'all seen The Whale? Or maybe if you... <laughs> I have to ask. So then you'll know that she's a healthcare worker. I want to know who that character is at the hospital. I want to know her co-workers who fear her. <laughs> you know? I want to know the patients that she, exactly. I, I, there, she should have her own movie about every character she plays in whatever film she's in. She's you know, really good that way. And um, Sadie Sink is just an anomaly. Where did this kid come from? Uh, come on, like, how are you that good at age 20 is something that you encounter, and there's probably another Sadie Sink in the room here, and we just don't know it yet, but call your agents quick, because we need you, we need more of you. Um, she has an ability to just N nail moments of truth. She's like a jewel with many facets in it, and you look at it one way and it's different, it's interesting that way. D Darren Aronofsky directed The Whale. He, he would, uh, with both of them, with both Hong and with Sadie, he would say, you know what, we got the shot, just um, you know, show off for us. Like, <laughs> we're here, like, what you got? Like, he just moves to spare. Um, th they have, I think, different processes according to you know their experience and like I say I'm flattering Sadie because she's got something on board that is prescient um, but uh, <laughs> I don't, um, but uh, Ty Simpkins he's uh, um, he's someone I watched Ty earn his stripes um, he he, he, that, that role got cast really quickly before we started shooting. Um, and and uh, I, I won't, I'm not telling tales out of school, but he had, he had some initial reticence at first that um, is absolutely fair. But, you know, we, we're not there to teach each other how to act. And, and I'm not saying that he needs that, but a young actor can come on a project sometimes and they can get left behind. Um, if they're not at a caliber of the rest of the cast. That, that wasn't this show, and I've seen that happen on other shows, and I, I, I do my best to try and give the attention to them that I can. But with Ty, he, he, it's like he grew up. He came of age. Like he really he, he went through a rite of passage, and it was exciting for me to see that in a young actor. Um, just just come to fruition. Um, Samantha Morton is um, wow. Samantha seems to be missing a layer or something. Like she has uh, an inv something transparent about her, and the choices that she makes are the pinnacle of authenticity. Like if, it, if it, she doesn't feel it, if it isn't real, she won't give it, and she gives everything. She's um, an actress who is uh, 
really, really true to herself um, and is unafraid to say, no, I think we should block the scene by having me upstage here when world-class auteur Darren Aronofsky has already shot the film, you know, in his mind. He goes, um, why? And, and she has a good reason for it. And it might have to do with creating distance between herself and, and her scene partner um, so that she can come physically closer, not just as the auteur would realize, okay, the reason I had you so close in the first place is because we couldn't move the camera that easily, but you're right, so we'll make it happen. You know, it, again, takes courage. You believe in yourself. Um, and I thought the pizza guy was great, too. <laughs> It's so true. None. It's so true. So you just showered your co-stars with very well-deserved praise. And yeah. I feel like this question came to mind through it being more of a me issue than anything. But I do feel like a lot of people can relate to the idea that it, it can be really difficult to tell yourself good job sometimes. So can you pinpoint something in the whale that now when you go back and you think about that experience, you yeah. watch the movie, you have to say to yourself, you know what? Damn, I'm proud of myself for pulling that off. My Mount Kilimanjaro in the whale was the pinnacle of when um, Charlie has to make his it was his apology to his daughter for his misdeeds and I mean that's that's the story really um, there's there's no bad guy in the whale maybe the bad guy is a concept like indifference or something like that but we, 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 I should mention, um, we had three weeks to rehearse for The Whale. A24 gave us that time. Like, that's not the norm. You know that. Like, y'all know that, right? When you, when you do a feature film, it's, let's be honest, it's usually you show up and you look at the sides and you scratch your head and go, you know what would be really cool? If, uh, I mean, um, we didn't do that. <laughs> we had learned um, the script chapter and verse and rehearsed it on a taped out stage, one to one. Um, approached it as if we were gonna do an off-Broadway run. And Darren declared us a theater company at the top of the three week rehearsal. And um, we made all of our mistakes. We made of all of our discoveries. We, we, um, we bonded, you know, we, we got all of the sillies out of us early on before we got to of the built set, the two bedroom apartment that had a submarine like environment. And we, we would be on top of one another. Um, and it was shot during the time of COVID. Um, we were all there. I hope, I hope and pray that your families are well. And I'm glad that we're all here together and that we can do this again. Um, thank you for you doing your part. We're, we're going to see this through. Um, that level of concern that came from the, the union's giving us um, uh, a pathway, uh, a method to get back to work um, was essential. And I think what it did was create um, an environment that had us more concerned for one another. And I think it shows um, in the films that were made during the period of 2020 to 2020, early 2022, 21 for the level of care that we had to show one another. I think it shows in, in the films. I mean, maybe someone very clever will write a thesis piece about this in years to come, I don't know, but I can kind of understand. I'm sorry, I've digressed. The tricky bit for me in The Whale was all of those circumstances. It, it wasn't the uh, four uh, hours of prosthetic makeup to become Charlie. I actually really quite enjoyed that, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I just, I love the craft of filmmaking and the artisans involved in it, and that's no exception. Um, Charlie's apology to um, Ellie. Uh, the, the whole film builds to this moment of will he or will he not have redemption? We don't know from moment to moment for how Sam Hunter structured the piece, which as many of you might know, was a stage play originally um, and then adapted for the screen by Sam Hunter. Um, not bad for a first time screenplay writer, right? Um, 
on the day that we did it, for a technical reason, we did we shot Sadie's side first. She was Sadie. She was per she was perfect. She was brilliant. Um, I, uh, I I couldn't not give every ounce of performance off camera to anyone. I think you should always give what you get off camera. When I know we're actors, we all joke, oh, I do my best work off camera, you know, because the pressure's off, you know, and nobody's looking at me. <laughs> but it's better when, you know, you don't do that and we work together. Um, I, I, in truth, I became, I was tired. I became fatigued um, when it was time to turn around to do my side because we had to wait for a, a lighting change. I think we needed to go to the door to shoot Ty. I don't know, for some reason or other, there was a gap between living the reality of that scene and when it came time to do my side, um, it wasn't there. It wasn't right. I mean, what I was doing, I knew, was serviceable. You could have passed it off as that being the scene, but I knew, Darren knew, we all knew. I just, I was all gas. I mean, it's all pedal and no gas is what I felt like. And I started to doubt myself horribly, and then things kind of went from bad to worse, you know. And, and Darren said, okay, um, what's going on? <laughs> and yeah, I just said, I'll, I'll get it together. He's all right. So we tried again, no good. Um, he cleared the set, and he gave me five minutes, and I had a little talk with myself, basically along the lines of, Get it together, you know, don't denigrate yourself as your brain can do to you. Keep your confidence level there and came back, tried again, nope, no dice. Not right. So he said, all right, um, it's lunch, let's go to lunch. It's, we retreat, it's the right thing to do. And so I did, I went back to my corner of the soundstage and stuck my lip out <laughs> and felt really, really sorry for myself and angry too that I'd come this far and I knew how short the schedule was. Uh, we wouldn't have time to come back and do it again or reshoot or anything like that. And he, Darren approached me and he said, um, you okay? I'm like, yeah, he said, you peaked. What? He said, you peaked, it happens. It happened to Ellen Burstyn on Requiem for a Dream. It happened to Mickey Rourke, the wrestler, Natalie. I mean, it happens. Have you ever heard a director say that to you? No, me neither. Like, I what? Like, I, I, I what? And he said, step back, we come back tomorrow, we try again. And I was, I, I was both relieved and shattered at the same time, and I'm, I told him, the, a director has never been this kind to me before, ever. And he said, I'm not being kind. <laughs> I'm protecting my movie <laughs> and your performance. Wow. So we came back the next day. I didn't grind my gears overnight and gnash my teeth. Don't second guess yourself. You're good. You're worth it. You know your job. I got some sleep and we tried it again. And we got what we got. But that was, that was my, that, that, was, that, was, that was the toughest part for me on that whole, whole shoot was then. Yeah. What an excellent answer to that question. I'm going go, to go to everyone. Yeah, definitely applaud for that moment. I'm about to jump into these. I want, Questions from the audience. Oh, okay. I have one just like very silly question that I think about a lot. <laughs> I'm what is, your man. What is, what, is, what is Darren Aronofsky's monitor dance? What does he do behind the monitor when you know that you've nailed something and he's happy and you know ready to say, we'll move on? I, I never really watched. He was always behind me, but I, I, he would say, oh, great. Um, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Why? We got it. <laughs> I always knew that we could move on when he stopped saying do it again. <laughs> it, it's, it's good to get Darren to smile, you know. It, it feels like the, the clouds part, the sun comes out, that creative intimidation goes away. <laughs> 
So many answers. Hit me. They're so good. All right. This first one is from Narnie. Did Aronofsky offer you that role, or was it something you read and pursued? Was there initial hesitation given how demanding it was? And then also, I heart you. It's Valentine's Day. I heart you. Oh, Everything should have an I heart you on it today. Happy B-Day. Yeah. <laughs> um, Darren, no, he didn't offer me the role right away. He didn't know if he could cast this because it has a real specific requirement in whoever the actor is. Um, so, you know, like I said, it was a play at first um, that was adapted for the screen. Um, Darren, when I met him, um, I only knew that this was the story of a man who'd been living alone. He had been harming himself by overeating. He has a strained relationship with his family, his immediate family, his daughter, who he's, from whom he is estranged. Um, and that our audience knows he's got five days. Um, what will happen during that time. That's about all I really knew about it because the screenplay wasn't really, you know, it was you know, lock and key. Um, and so I, I, when I met him, he, he uh, elaborated on the story and he, he told me that um, he needed to create Charlie, I mean, not only from, you know, an acting standpoint, but from the outside in. Hence the need for um, prosthetics. Um, elaborate prosthetic makeup and his partner in collaboration had been Adrian Moreau for several films of his who's a wizard with this and he, Oscar nominated right now fingers crossed for Adrian um, he uh, he needed to the, the actor whoever whether it's me or anyone else of course I was like oh please don't be me please don't be me you know, <laughs> you know that's what we do but um, would need to to wear this gear um, in in really the same way that um, you would do, I don't know, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, you know, or a creature or a, like an animal or, you know, whoever, raptors, you can be anybody. Um, and Charlie's no exception to it. And um, the difference was that um, the sum total of all the apparatus would be quite cumbersome. and. I thought, that's no problem. I mean, I, I might not be smart, but I'm really strong. You know, so, you know, I wanted to, wanted to be on board for sure. No, he didn't offer it to me. We, we did a reading at St. Mark's in the East Village um, for interested parties, producers, you know, there's always someone um, to find out if uh, this, this was feasible, if it made sense. And uh, I guess that was my audition then. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful we went forward with it um, and then you know the whole journey began with uh, preparing to do Charlie and there's a whole lot of steps in there I'd be glad to tell you about unless you want to ask me another question. Here, well here's one that gets into the the prosthetics this is from Amel um, I'll read the whole bit here because it shouts out some other titles that I love love you in Encino men and airheads and have uh, tried to follow you since this turn in the whale is so extreme and heartbreaking. My question is really only technical. What were the proportions of physical change versus special effects versus visual effects, and how did that affect you becoming Charlie? Proportions between physical change. And it ended with a heart. <laughs> can can heart. confirm it did end with a heart. <laughs> um, now I totally forgot the question. <laughs> uh, but I, I will tell you that um, to do Charlie, the gear was cumbersome as well it should have been. The man's body weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds and there's no way to pretend at that and be authentic, dignified, and respectful of a person whose body is of those dimensions. And I say that because so many of the films and depictions of people who live with obesity in projects previously over the years I don't know they they look they look like a fit actor in like a cotton batting Halloween costume you know in a way and and our suspension of belief is tested <laughs> to see that to my I'll speak for myself um, and and very often obesity is used in films to vilify a character or make them the, the butt of a cheap joke or, 
you know, just, just be mean-spirited. And, and this, is not, this is not that project. And, and, and it, I know that's a risk to do this. It's part of the reason why I, I took it on board and wanted to, because I think you should risk in art, not in life so much, but in your art, in, in creating this work, because that's where the most growth is going to come from. I mean, that's win, lose, or draw. That's what you're going to learn from. And you know what? Something interesting or good might come as a result of, of taking that leap of faith. So to do Charlie, um, I, I needed to learn to move the way that man would by uh, getting all the help I could. Uh, Beth Lewis is, uh, was, was a dancer with Palabla's company for years. And she's one of those, you know, the, one of those remarkable individuals who knows everything about human kinesthesiology. Of, like, you can name all the little weird muscles in your forearm. Like, like ow, ow. And she's like, oh, you're abdugulagata. Shmata borbidors. <laughs> right. um, but sh but we, sh we, we understood uh, centers of gravity, paid attention to momentum, um, to not just sell that the body that I was wearing was heavier um, than it really was. I mean, it was, it was cumbersome. Um, and, and out of respect, I never weighed the parts, by the way. I don't know how much it weighed. I just know that it, it felt heavy. Um, and uh, to, 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 to sell who he is without ever falling into the trappings of what we had seen previously, which really just puts quotation marks around that character. Um, I think that it's the perfect combination of what I love about my job, which is to bring the, the physical aspect of performing to a character um, in a way where you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be a real physical performance. You know, doing Link, the caveman, yeah, that's a physical performance. That's silent film stars run amok, you know, that's what that is. Um, with with uh, Charlie, in some ways, it's really not that far removed. You know, it's still a physical performance to give. Um, what was the third part of that question again? It was uh, mainly a question about the balance, the balance of physical change and special effects and visual effects. Yeah. Um, for the record, <laughs> it has been widely misreported that that was a digital creation. It wasn't. It wasn't. With the exception of maybe a, a light curative on a, you know, like a piece of fabric that was in its own movie one morning or, you know, or, or at one point when Charlie rises to uh, go to bed, he takes his shirt off and, and uses his walker to get down the hallway. Um, that was a day where uh, Adrian's full uh, body um, was used and that meant head to toe um, uh, applications and um, there, I think there might have been a seam or something that just got digitally removed. But I promise you, um, everything that you saw there was the, close to the same process that um, was used when I did um, uh, Bedazzled years and years earlier, which had a lot of prosthetic makeup also. Um, one thing you should point out is the process that's changed, and you're going to see this in years to come. It's like right now, but you're gonna see this. Um, has anyone here been done, ever done a life cast? Anyone, you know, they pour goop on your face, okay. It, it, very often those busts, they're, they're used and then compounding on top of it, you know, sculpting for whatever it is, big nose, horns, whatever. Um, with a life cast, the weight of the um, material pulls the face down like this, and it makes everything look like a death mask or you're on a roller coaster or freeze frame, you know. With, so that means that the, the makeup artists have to kind of work against that and build something on top of the face that's stretched out to not have it be there and then put whatever element it is they want on top of that. With um, 3D printing, the face is scanned or the body, that information fed into a computer, everything created virtually. Charlie's body was created down to the pore, I promise you, as if it were a texture map. Um, so it was that precise. And from that, then uh, the, um, the molds were printed. And from that, then the compounding and sculpting could occur. 
So it's seamless and that's of paramount importance in this movie because if we didn't have a Charlie that you believed, we wouldn't have a movie. I mean, our, our, our finely tuned 21st century eyes and neurons are so adept at picking out any inconsistency in digital imagery, whether you know it or not, you, you do. Just look at anything from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I go, oh, how quaint that was. <laughs> really? You know? But it's like we, we have this um, skill that we weren't really aware of. And that would have had happened also with Charlie if you didn't automatically believe that he was a man who was as he presented. Um, that was important too. Yeah. Let's hit. Tyler's question. Here's because here's a title we haven't really talked about. How is it working with uh, Giancarlo Esposito? Great! Are you kidding? Bone. My man, <laughs> Giancarlo is a force of nature for good. Oh, he's such a great guy. Um, he, he's the nicest man who has scared the shit out of me on screen. I mean, I don't know about you, but he is one scary mofo when he wants to be. But what a delight. Um, in Monkey Bone, I forget the name of his character right now, but I know he did it from his knees, like Marcel Marceauing it, you know. Um, and he uh, he has such a, a a joy and commitment and um, a, a a positive outlook on all the work that he does. Um, whoever asked that question, you know what I'm talking about. You must be a fan of his because I know I am too. Giancarlo is really, he's the man, he's the man. That question became a priority because uh, we were talking, we had a feeling it was going in that, a in that direction with the answer. He's he, a good one. You know what, he, gave me a, he gave me a challenge coin. You know what a challenge coin is? You know, like military cops and stuff like that. Well, George Lucas was handing out challenge coins to so, you know, the select few on the Star Wars project that he did in Mandalorian, you might say that. He gave me a challenge coin. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't give it to my kids. <laughs> Let me get the wrong one. <laughs> Here's one uh, from Liana. How do you approach creating characters in such different worlds? For example, you know, George of the Jungle and the Whale are the examples Liana listed here. Do you use the same technique for both comedy and drama, or is it something different? I don't I, Comedy isn't, I'm the least funny person I know, okay? <gasps> Honest, like, come on, seriously, like, don't ask me to tell you, I know one joke, that's it. Horse walks into a bar, asks a bartender for a bottle of beer, bartender says, why the long face? That's my one joke, okay? That's all I know. That's it for comedy. In, in approaching that any part, I think, if you, the moment you think you're funny, you're not. <laughs> Wrong, you're not. If you approach what you're being told as a comedy, as a straight ahead drama, you're likely gonna be a little more close to what it is that you need to do to be truthful to the piece. And in some ways, the opposite's true also. I mean, what's the saying, how's the phrase go? Comedy is, comedy is tragedy plus time. <laughs> it's just tragedy plus time. <laughs> You know, we laugh about things that are tragic. You know, do the math. But I, 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 I think that you just need to approach it with as much commitment as 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 you can. That, and be brave because the again have courage because pretty much at the end of the day, actors we're we're all up here dropping trow and. <laughs> And, 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 and pretending it doesn't bother us or something like that, so that your audience can have its reaction. I mean, it's, it's just the essentials. All right, yeah. I've got one from Jennifer here now. Every actor has the mean voice in their head that says they're not good enough, not attractive enough, or that this is their last job and they'll never work again. How do you battle that voice in your own head? You work with Darren Aronofsky and, and hopefully he'll tell you, you peaked. <laughs> instead of stop sucking and do your job, you know? <laughs> That's, be kind to yourself. Uh, there's plenty of people out there who want to bring you down. Why help them? Why? 
be your own best advocate, you know? You don't have to tell anybody you're doing it. <laughs> you don't. But gun for yourself. You're worth it. My apologies if I don't have the pronunciation right. This is from Anahi. What changes would you like to see in the industry? Big broad question, but one well worth asking. A lot of them are changing that I, I'm really glad for now. I, I am glad that representation is the direction we're going in. I'm glad to see that, that um, multiculturalism is embraced. I am glad to see that uh, all gender sexualities are being brought to a place where it's, it, it's, not, um, it's not italicized in any way. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that that's becoming legislated. I'm, I'm glad for um, the, uh, the, the Me Too movement. I think that we've made great progress. Um, I'm glad that we have, uh, we have support systems in place, um, hotlines to call for all manner of needs and reasons. Um, I'm glad to see that, uh, um, that, that contracts are being reviewed in, um, in light of all the new streaming formats and different ancillary ways that we get paid our residuals. That's important. Um, yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good, those are, those are the greatest hits. If I'm forgetting anything, shout one out, please, because I'm likely I'll agree with you. Solid list right there. Yeah. This one's from Jacqueline. What is your favorite part of the process when approaching a character, and what do you miss most about your characters when you're done filming? The most, the, the first part? The, the first most? part is your favorite part of the process when approaching a character. Um, my favorite part is uh, imagining the possibility of what you're going to do. Um, uh, hanging on to that enthusiasm that you first feel when you read the work, whatever it is that says, this is for me, I want to do this, I must, my teeth are sweating, I have to do this. And I know you know what I'm talking about. Hang on to that um, because by story's end or when the journey is over, you might find yourself feeling a bit rueful um, and with good reason. When, I'll share this with you, when I, when I the last day of, of playing Charlie, I, I, I became quite emotional. I felt like I knew this guy. I, I know that's all woo-woo actory and everything, but it moved me to think that for all the blood and love and sweat and tears and everything that went into to doing that, I'll gladly do it all over again. And it wasn't lost on me that in a world that we live in now, where in of the ways that we are prone to mistreating one another, and we've made progress We're going down that list, ticking the boxes off of saying, you may not do this any longer. The last one, in my view, is bias against those who live with obesity. It's in our culture, it's in our vernacular, and we can retire a few phrases and, and ideologies, and a film like the whale is the first to meet those head on. And um, I know also from the people who I, I spoke with to research to play Charlie, um, who, have, who have lived with obesity or are living with obesity, who are bedridden or who have had um, gastric, like a bariatric procedure to save their life all have something in common, and it's, it's this. When they were very small, there was an adult somewhere, a parent, a father, who spoke to that little kid in a way that was deplorable and recriminating and made them feel as if, just made them feel awful for essentially who they are as they present. 
And maybe there is an apology made or who knows, but the point is it stays with you and it sets a pattern. It encodes something into your psyche that stays with you and it gets repeated and repeated and repeated. And it can manifest itself in all sorts of ways. Pick the greatest hits of whatever the vice is, sex, drugs, alcohol, gambling, eating disorders. It's all there. It's fundamentally the same thing. I digress a little bit. Years and years and years ago, I was in Bangkok. I, was, I visited a temple, a giant reclining golden Buddha. It was incredible. And out front was a sign that was pushed, pushed into the dirt, and it read, painful indeed is vindictive speech. And it's true. Basically, don't be unkind to one another, because it does have real-life health circumstances and ramifications on one another. I saved a, a particular one for last because I feel this way and, and I hope Lacey doesn't mind but I want to add to it. Lacey asks, how do you keep your heart so soft? And I'll also add warm and like coming across like someone who, who deeply respects and values the opportunity to be here and to get to do what they want to do. And I don't want to speak for everyone in the room, but I'm pretty sure you got such a warm welcome here, not just because your work is good, but because you radiate warmth, kindness, and respect for this class. How, how do you keep your heart in the right place in all of those respects? Um. Remember who and what you love, because that's the power that will give you the energy that you can use for your work. And you can keep them separate, but just remember who it is, whether it's your kids, it's my kids, your family, you, you know, whatever it is, hang on to that and let that be a part of your work too. But keep it a secret. <laughs> Could have kept you here all day. <laughs> and then congratulations on everything. Thank you so much for sharing some of your experiences and your craft with us today. You have to do this again. Like a mile long list of questions. You got so many accomplishments we need to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.